thank you for joining Wars of the Rosies as we continue with part six of a world journey behind the Mau Mau by the Emperor Archer AMORC. An article from Rosicrucian Digest, volume 32, number six, June 1954. The Thought of the Month Behind the Mau Mau by the Emperor Archer AMORC. This article is the sixth of a series being written by the Imperator after his return from a world journey in behalf of the Rosicrucian Order. Editor. Next to a religious war, a racial conflict is the greatest blight upon the growth of civilization. The former is more appalling because of all of the atrocities committed by it are done in behalf of a professed spiritual ideal. In racial conflict, one group of humanity tries to justify a claim of superiority over all others on the grounds of color or purity of descent. Anthropologists and ethnologists have long established that the human race today is mongrel. There are no pure strands. Even a casual review of history would reveal the tides of various races sweeping one over the other. The first great intermingling of races began during the conquest of Alexander the Great, the fusions of East and West through the campaigns of the Roman legions and the expansion of the empire. Added to the amalgamation, racial hatred has two primary causes. The more common one is that of custom and ignorance. Social values are taught at an early age or acquired in childhood as personal experience. The child has a strong inclination to mimic his parents in behavior and in idealism. The prejudices and preferences of his parents in social relations are easily adopted without question. There is no concern as to the origin of these social views or as to their need. If such are superficially considered or at all, it is the traditional answers for justifying them that are given. The second principal cause of racial hatred is the sense of inferiority felt by many individuals. Actually, many persons are very conscious of their culture, social and economical inferior status. There is no function or activity of their own initiative in which they can particularly excel. Consequently, as a defense mechanism, they are obliged to restore to an assumed racial superiority. It may be that their race in general, because of centuries of climatic, geological, and historical advantages has gained a cultural supremacy. Therefore, the individual assumes vicariously from that fact a personal superiority to all other people who are of a different race. Nevertheless, as individuals, they may be very inferior in capabilities to those of the race which they consider beneath them. Another factor in racial hatred is the varied social idealism of a people. A race or people are not necessarily inferior, even though by our standards of culture they are primitive. The wealthy American or European tourist upon visiting the banks of the Ganges in India often experiences a pathetic feeling towards the Hindu devotees and fakirs who dwell there. The people of some of these sects practicing asceticism are sworn of all worldly goods. They renounce the world and live in extreme poverty and squalor. Their value of life is wholly subjective. It is a world of the mind. It affords them a far greater gratification than do the automobile, the television, the refrigerator, and other mechanical devices of pleasure and convenience of the Western world. The argument is not that the people of the Western world should condone the people of the East and their ways, but rather that they should not think of them as being inferior because of the difference in their ideals and practices. Further, many of the advances of the white race, for example, are not the consequence of the individual members who now enjoy them. Rather, they are the inheritance of society. Most often, the individual himself has contributed little towards the cultural improvements of his own society. The people of other races, if given an equal opportunity, could accomplish the same. Every liberal society where all races are accepted as equal and are given the same advantages has been the means of proving that biologically there is no superior race. Causes of Uprisings The current native uprising in Kenya colony 
East Africa are the results of a combination of factors. Though the Europeans or whites profess no liberal racial discrimination, this factor nevertheless is closely tied to the prevailing problem. The whites in Kenya gradually have allocated to themselves the best lands. The Highlands. The climate is more temperate in the Highland region, even though the capital of the colony, Nairobi, situated in it, is not far from the equator. Much of the land is fertile and normally, with the development of irrigation projects, there is sufficient water. The government has established fairly large reservations for the fast-growing Kikuyu tribe. These reservations are not exclusively the best land. In fact, much of its jungle or deep forest. At first, the Kikuyu, as in the case of most primitive people, were primarily nomadic. They grazed their cattle over the extensive reservation. When their grazing land was depleted, they sought to move elsewhere. The problem of confining them then arose. It was to the advantage of the European settlers to teach these natives agriculture and soil conservation. Such industry would, of course, rebound to the benefit of the natives as well as be a means of asserting them a stable food supply. The Kikuyu are disinclined to remain permanently in one location. Centuries of custom and its influences are not easily mitigated in one or two generations. Agricultural pursuits are far more laborious in comparison to the relatively simple life of herding cattle. To the Kikuyu, as to many primitive people, the menial duties of tending crops were thought to be beneath the dignity of the males. All the while, the numerical growth of the tribe was crowding the reserves, that is, particularly the land best adapted to their needs. More and more they deserted their plots and sought grazing for their cattle elsewhere, only to find that such land had been acquired by Europeans who, as individuals or as land companies, were exploiting their opportunities. These natives who diligently tilled the soil in the areas allowed to them soon found themselves in competition with the European growers. The colonists controlled the marketing association. Thus, the Kikuyu growers, whose labor and cost of production were cheaper, found that to remain independent, they would have no market or would have to sell their crops at cost or at a loss. Further, these tribesmen were denied the freedom to drive their cattle where they would. As a result, they found it difficult to do more than barely exist as agriculturalists, following the white man's training. Kenya manufactures practically nothing. It is difficult to persuade new industries to enter the colony to make an investment in this remote region, and it would be especially so during the present period of unrest. The colony imports almost everything except those basic foodstuffs that can be raised locally. A high import duty is levied on such commodities as petrol, machinery, and clothing. At first, it might seem incongruous that a high duty should be placed on commodities which are not competitive. The duty is required, for example, to build roads. These are badly needed, especially paved roads. Most of the existing roads are corrugated and extremely dusty in the dry season of the year. And in the wet, they are quagmires. The outlying farmer, or rancher, is forever protesting the transportation facilities. It is the relatively few whites of the colony who must pay the duty. The natives cannot afford to do so, and the Asiatic assiduously avoid, wherever possible, the purchase of imported produce, and they own comparatively little land. The Europeans, therefore, bear the principal share of the taxation of the whole colony. There is considerable propaganda by the Department of Native Affairs about the assistance which the colonial government is extended to the natives. It is disclosed how they are given education in agriculture and other technical subjects, and how they are taught hygiene and sanitation. Hospitals and other humanitarian facilities, it is pointed out, are made available to them. It cannot be denied that this is done, but one nevertheless discovers that the approach to the problem is not as realistic as it might be. The whites or Europeans are afraid of their tenuous position in East Africa. Extensive education and equality for the native, in the liberal sense of the word, 
will place the colonists at a political disadvantage. It would be incumbent upon the white colonists then to allow full suffrage to the natives. The numerical superiority of the natives could gain them political supremacy in Kenya which would be highly disastrous to the colonists. The psychological effect of all this is the enlargement of the demeanor of superiority on the part of the whites in all of their relations with the natives. It is not that the average colonist is abusive in his conduct, but he shows a mere tolerance of the natives. He displays a patronizing manner towards them as one would towards his domesticated work animals. The white colonist will go to some length to point out the natives' idiosyncrasies and his primitive and childlike habits. However, the colonist of long standing prefers them that way. He is actually fearful of any cultural and social advancement upon the part of the tribesmen. A prominent Kenya resident who had spent 40 years in the colony, said to us in referring to the dress of the natives, why have them wear shoes? They would only take them off when in the bush and wear them tied around their neck. Then he continued to defend his position that the Kikuyu should not have their standards changed. If you put glass in windows of any quarter you provide for them, they will cover the glass with paper. He was implying to us that such tastes and habits of the natives are inherent, that therefore new environment and education could not possibly change them, and that any attempt to do so would be an economic waste. The falsity of these arguments is evident to any thoughtful observer. They are based upon the premise of trying to produce radical changes in the lives of the older generation. It is true that an old dog does not readily take to new tricks. This, however, is not a racial characteristic. Resistance to change is as common to the white race as it is to any other people. The children of these Kenya natives of one or two generations hence would more easily adapt themselves to these conveniencies and standards which the Europeans think best and which really are improvements. It is a matter of giving them the opportunity to make the adaption. Racial characteristics which have an influence on social customs, it is admitted, may take many generations to diminish even those subject to environmental changes. However, fundamental improvements through education could be had in the children of the very next generation if there were a sincere effort to do so. These negative arguments advanced by the average businessman and rancher in the Kenya area but not all of them, of course, convey the impression that the efforts put forth in the natives' behalf have not been as extensive or as effectual as they might have been. Education in Conflict In several instances, natives passing through colonial schools have been singled out for further education in England. They have eventually been graduated from an English university and return to their native land. We were informed that this policy has been encouraged by England and, in itself, is worthy. In England, the native found a far more liberal attitude towards him than he had experienced in his homeland. He came to realize that he was not inherently, intellectually or otherwise, inferior to white men. With opportunity and incentive, he and the members of his race could achieve prominence and power equal to that of the whites. Upon returning to his people from the university, he immediately has begun to expound his new idealism and to exhort them to demand certain conditions which he considered to be their right. As a result, these educated natives have been regarded by the European colonists as agitators. It is true that they have fomented unrest but not always entirely without some justification. They have likewise been accused of trained communist organizers and agitators. That some of them may be is to be expected. The situation in Kenya is conducive to such activity. However, it is hardly likely that every educated native returning to Kenya and invading against conditions of his people is a communist. The conduct of many of the European colonists towards the native tends to intensify resentment and fans' hatred upon the part of the tribesmen. Some of these colonists who were born in Kenya 
or who have resided there for a considerable time display a habitual contentment towards the natives. They are mostly unaware of their shockingly offensive attitude. We have seen a colored young man, a native, who was an assistant to us on a safari, refuse the purchase of food because of his race. The supply of food we had with us on safari was low. We were obliged to stop for food and drink at a rest house miles from any community. These were gladly sold us by the white proprietor. The native assistant had funds provided by us, and we had left him on his own resources to make his own purchases. When we were loading our equipment about to resume our journey, we casually inquired if he had any food. He replies, not for the last two days. The proprietor of the previous rest house had, unbeknown to us, also refused to sell him food because he was a native. Obviously, this practice is not carried on everywhere, but it is a common example of the discriminatory attitude. Notwithstanding his hunger, our assistant had not touched the tins containing our reserved food supply on the top of our safari car. He preferred to go hungry rather than to ask that we share this emergency supply with him. We immediately purchased a little food, as if for ourselves, and then took it out to him that he might eat. The children of some of the Kenya colonists in their innocence are often arrogant in their manner of addressing native servants. These children speak more respectfully to their pet dogs. Older men who serve as domestic servants, men old enough to be their fathers or grandfathers, these children call boys. But what is most objectionable? They address them in a commanding and affronting tone of voice. It is painful to human dignity to see these older men obliged to bow to the arrogance of some moppet of four or five years of age. The cause is discerned in the indifference of the parents who do not correct the child or even heed to it, indicating an acceptance of the custom. The native who eventually rises above his fear and awe of the white man and who has acquired some education deeply resents this attitude. Beneath his complacent demeanor, there often lies a smoldering hate. He is reluctant to express himself upon the matter, but if he believes he is among friends, he will relate his feelings. Terrorism and Atrocities The Mau Mau terrorism has not been exaggerated by the press. Campaigns of terrorism with waves of atrocities do exist. Ranch homes in the bush, meaning the bat country, are broken into by mobs instilled with the hatred against the whites. These Kikuyu terrorists murder men, ravish women, destroy or steal the livestock, and burn all dwellings. They are continually on a prowl for firearms. All colonists are required to register their firearms. If they lose them, or if they are stolen by the Mau Mau, they suffer severe penalties. Posters with graphic designs appear everywhere in Nairobi, warning against the loss of firearms. For this reason and for their own protection, men are seen carrying sidearms and automatic rifles even on the streets of Nairobi. Women who come into the city from the bushland carry revolvers and holsters. Murderers in the heart of the city are not uncommon at night. The Mau Mau marauders take refuge in the great foresties of the north not far distant from Nairobi. There, the various gangs await instruction from the Mau Mau leader, currently Didan Kamati. As we go to the press, this leader has threatened the life of Queen Elizabeth if he travels through the bush area of Uganda adjoining Kenya. Who are the Mau Mau? They are a secret society formed among the Kikuyu for the avowed purpose of driving out the European colonists of Kenya and avenging themselves for actual and imagined wrongs. Through compulsion, they force many of their people into their primitive secret society. The initiation rites are fearsome and terrifyingly impressive to the simple Kikuyu mind. The candidate is obliged to take a blood oath pledge that upon demand of his superiors, he will enter into acts of terrorism, kill, rape, and destroy without question. To refuse to do so means that the member of the society himself will be murdered. The ritual of introduction into the secret society consists of 
primitive and very obnoxious rites, a concoction of human blood, bowel, and the viscera of animals over which a weird liturgy is held, must be drank by the candidate, the members, the wild chat, and enter into hysterical liturgies amounting to a frenzy of intoxication. The candidate is told that the oath he has taken has invoked malevolent forces and powers. If he subsequently violates this pledge by reservation of thought or by failure to act, he will draw upon himself the full efficacy of the evil forces. Many of the Kukuyu members are not in sympathy with the acts of the Mau Mau, but are fearful of exposing them. Those who have been initiated into the society, though not desirous of supporting its aims, are as afraid of the imagined supernatural power that will be invoked against them if they refuse orders, as they are of being killed by other Mau Mau. A number of the Mau Mau, who were inducted into the society under compulsion, have subsequently fled to the British troops and native police barracks in the area for protection. This assures them they will not be exposed to retaliation by other members of the society. However, they are mostly uncooperative. They refuse to reveal the whereabouts of the roving terrorist gangs. To them, this revolution would constitute a violation of the pledge. It would immediately invoke the threatened malevolent powers if they violate the oath. Then, by their own mental suggestion, they magnify every illness or minor injury they later receive as being an infliction imposed upon them by the forces or powers whom they have renounced. They deject in evident terror is an excellent example of what Dr. H. Spencer Lewis refers to in his book, Mental Poisoning. The Kenya authorities, having some knowledge of the psychological nature of the Kikuyu, have struck upon a resourceful idea for breaking the mental influence of the oath for those who wish to be freed of it. No amount of persuasion, of course, could convince the members of the secret society that the oath they took had not established a nexus between them and supernatural entities. To remove this bond, they believe a stronger one of like nature must be employed. Consequently, the police authority have induced certain witch doctors to exercise, that is, to sever the hold of the oath upon the members of the society. The ritual of exorcism is as fantastic as weird as the original one imposing the oath. It employs all those elements which are related to magic, the mystery of death, blood, and the obnoxious acts which suggest malevolence to the primitive mind. As a result, the former Mau Mau feels purged at the conclusion of the rite and talks freely without fear of supernatural retribution. However, the great number of the Mau Mau who are taken prisoner do not regret what they have done or change their attitude. In the bush a few miles from Nairobi, we have seen one of the concentration camps for these prisoners. It consists of nothing but a high barbed wire fence with an open area in which they are confined. They sleep upon open ground under the watchful eye of native police. These prisoners turn and glare sullenly and with hatred at any curious white who may pause to look upon them. Menacing Situations British troops search for the Mau Mau in the forest lands, even with the aid of planes, may be likened to the proverbial hunt for the needle in a haystack. For every group of terrorists they capture, there are a greater number at liberty. Kikuyu women in Nairobi and the surrounding area feed them surreptitiously and steal weapons for the aid of the society. Some of these women are, of course, related to the Mau Mau, but most are fearful of the consequence of refusal. This constitutes one of the menaces of the situation. The economic and social structure in Kenya is such that almost every European colonist employs a number of natives. Many of these are domestic servants. A white woman colonist is never quite certain whether her domestic servants, those who cook, clean house, and take care of her children, are Mau Mau in sympathy or are not. 
the British commander in chief in charge of the reprisal against the Mau Mau, has tried to drive them out by the added method of penalizing any native known to have given them either maize or cattle. Though the mother country, England, has sent troops to Kenya upon appeal for what is called police duty. Dissatisfaction is heard among the colonists. Some of these individuals of prominence in Nairobi relate their feelings that England was not sufficiently sympathetic with their situation regardless of the troops and the munitions being sent. There was criticism of England's having afforded some of the natives higher education, though of course such an objection obviously was prejudiced. Further, these colonists were of the opinion that England's response to the situation was neither as prompt nor as ample as it should have been. An evident fact is that England, because of her global relations at this time in particular, as also is the case of the United States, must be exceptionally cautious that none of her acts appear to be persecution of another race or people. Such could be made excellent propaganda for Soviet ends. England is, of course, and rightly so, not too sympathetic with the racial attitude of the colonists and cannot see eye to eye with them in many of their policies. Such statements, however, are not uttered in the press in Nairobi. The consensus of opinion among reliable authorities with whom we talked in Kenya is that the Mau Mau situation was spread far beyond the borders of Kenya and threatened the white man's unsteady hold upon the continent of Africa. Even the United States has a deep, though not publicly announced, concern about the political danger, especially if the present situation is to be taken advantage of by the Soviets. Africa, generally, is rich in resources which the Western world can ill afford to lose, particularly to an enemy. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.